and gone. Well, the, 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 the applause meter shows they like you. Oh, yeah, there you go. Hey, I've listened to your stuff for years. It's, it's nice to have you here finally. Thank you, yes. Uh, I've always wanted to see that thing. It's just a yeah. coffee cup and somebody yeah. put a picture on it. And it's just straight, straight coffee. Yeah, they always give you mugs, don't they? Yeah. Well, as you get older, it's hard to get a firm grip on things. Right? <laughs> they, 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 I know. Two hands, they put another handle on here in a couple of years, so you're going to really get a hold of it there. <laughs> you, uh, you've been performing for about how long now? I mean, really, oh, since you became really well, well as Elton John for about 10 years. Right. But before that, in the dark ages, um, probably about six years before that. Yeah. Mm. Somebody told me you came, when I, I find it hard to believe, from a rather conservative background, your parents. Uh, yeah, my father was a um, uh, squadron leader in the Royal Air Force England, and uh, uh, it came from a working class background, but because of uh, uh, the rank that he attained, he became a little, uh, very middle class. Right. Yes. I'm typical middle class English. <laughs> well, uh, why, do you, why do you suppose, Elton, in, in, the, in the past few years, decade or so, that so many English groups caught the imagination of, uh, of the American kids? Um, there's something, there's got to yeah, be something there. I thought there. about it a lot. I think in England, you see, um, when I grew up, and I'm 33, and I can remember growing up with radio. Right. Um, which I'm very pleased that I did grow up with radio because it's a tremendous thing. Um, you know, uh, I remember like, like Edgar Berg, and we had one uh, like Edgar Berg and a ventriloquist on the radio, which I mean, <laughs> what a free ride. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> Sounds strange to yeah. begin with and get away but, uh, with murder. Oh, so I think a lot of the English uh, acts that come over and lead singers, um, uh, like the lead singer from Queen, Freddie Mercury, Mick Jagger, people like right. that. They, um, English have a sense of vaudeville, um, right. and they, they're always far more ostentatious, usually, right. than um, the American counterparts, who tend to be far more laid back. Um, English people, it's like English comedians, they can't wait to do shows and, and put drag on. I mean, yeah. it's like Benny Hill, I, I grew up, I was about seven... <laughs> He knocks me out. Yeah. He puts me away. Well, I've been watching Ben Hill Science Science about seven or eight years old, and all of a sudden he becomes a cult figure over here. Yeah, kind of... he puts me away. Yeah. He's got great delivery, he plays great characters, and he's got a wonderful English face. English people can't wait to get into drag. English men, I'm saying. I mean, if that you want to see for yourselves, come to the forum. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is true. Yes. They, they like to put on more, as you say, a yeah. vaudeville-oriented yeah. show. Very, yeah, very much. When you listen to radio, who were your favorite musical personalities? I mean, did, Oh, in England, you've probably never heard of them. Eve Boswell, she was South African. Uh, a, no. a piano player called Winifred Atwell. It was, right, um, I know that name. Um, Any American was, performers at all? Not really, because uh, when I sort of took notice of American performers when television first came in, and everybody would sit at home on Sunday afternoons and watch the Liberati show. I mean, that was right. everyone used to come around, or the Perry Yeah, you got to admit, he's flamboyant. Liberace. Yeah, yeah, I once did the Royal Variety Show in England, which is a command performance for the Queen of England. Um, and you fly back there. Uh, I was on tour in America, and you fly back, and you, it's horrible. You sort of have one hour rehearsal, and everyone's heard it around like cattle. It's an experience to do it once. But I had the chief dressing room of the Palladium, which is not very big. There was Jack Jones, myself, and Liberace. And I'd arrived, and Jack Jones was there. And I had three outfits specially made. These are the days when I wore shoes that made me the height of John Wayne. Yeah, this is now... <laughs> you're now in your, what, more conservative uh, period? Because you've gone through yeah, a few well, transitions. Well, no, I... you? <laughs> For you... For you, it's conservative. Well, you used to come on with some really wild... I, I still got them all at home, and I just go upstairs and look at them sometimes and think, how the hell did you ever put that on? <laughs> I've still got, I, I got a... I used to wear those eight-inch shoes. I yeah. mean, I became chairman of a football club in England. I was um, six, foot, uh, six foot three when right. I joined. I'm now only five foot eight. <laughs> uh, so, uh, anyway, but anyway, anyway this is Liberace story. Yeah, I had these three outfits made, and I thought, hmm, you're not going to beat me this time. I got these three flashy outfits. He came in with trunk after trunk <laughs> after trunk, and it was a one outfit, yeah. the, the, electric, the electric outfit with the bulbs and everything. And he was so sweet and so nice, and yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I like him a lot. You know, when he shows the performer. rings to the audience, I kind of sort of get a little bit edgy, but... Uh, yeah, he knows exactly what he's doing. He oh, plays absolutely. It well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, was a, there was a documentary on PBS some weeks ago about um, your, tri your trip to Russia, mm. which is rather fascinating. Did, were you a little apprehensive about that, because you're the first... Um, rock performer? Not, not, um, not really the first. They've had people like B.B. King and I think the you know, nitty-gritty dirt man went over there. Um, right. But, um, 
Yeah, we were very, very apprehensive. Uh, last year I did a tour with just a percussion player and uh, I wanted to play places in Europe uh, that I hadn't played before and I hadn't really played Europe to that great an extent. Right. And we went there and my parents were invited, so it's very protocol. I mean, we were all scared to death of flying Aeroflot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and but you, you know, got so I couldn't get out of it. And in fact, on the way home, when we took off, my personal assistant um, and myself, uh, when the plane took off, our seats weren't fastened to the floor and we went straight back right now. <laughs> And only when you get off of Aeroflot do you find out that they, uh, they don't have any emergency procedure. They have no oxygen masks or no, you know, they don't go through a procedure when you take off. And a pilot, a friend of mine who works for British Airways said, no, they, only the crew get oxygen. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you do, you get a prayer book or a hymnal yeah. or something? And... I've got a few friends I'm buying them Aeroflot tickets. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, you were a tremendous success over there. Yes, I think it's fairly... Um, I was very disappointed, in fact, when they <laughs> invaded Afghanistan because I was growing some of my best pot there. Now, um... <laughs> uh, no, it, it, we came away with a sense of a little achievement in the fact that they wanted people to come over. They wanted the Neil Diamonds and the groups like the Who and the Beach Boys and people like that, Paul McCartney. And we were sort of like a test. They flew over to England. And I was sort of like a guinea pig. And I'm, I, I always say I'm fairly safe. Um, I'm a sort of... Um, I compare myself to Rod Stewart a lot, because yeah. we're friends. And if we ever live next door to each other in a semi-detached house, he would always have a terribly untidy garden right. and um, have his head rolled up in a scarf and have his clothes on the line. I would have my garden all prim and proper. Neat. So I call that, you know, I'm sort of Jorgensen's and he's Safeways. So uh, I was pretty <laughs> I was pretty safe, you know? Um, and uh, they liked it, you know, I wasn't too outrageous. They, they said, please don't kick the piano stool away in Benny and the Jets and don't sing back in the USSR. So I compromised. I thought, well, uh, stupid not singing back in the USSR because the R Russian kids loved it. Right. So I didn't kick the piano stool. You have to make a little compromise. Um, I got criticized a little because of uh, political situations. Right. But if you want to chip away at situations, you have to realize that you're not that important when it comes to the particular no. um, political event. You just have to chip away at these things. And I, I was really pleased when I came away because the Russian kids are the same as kids anywhere please tell people to come and they're kind of closet fans too because they don't want to come out and say they dig the western no music. there's not a gay population over there. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it that way. Oh. <laughs> didn't mean it that way. oh a closet oh no you... they know they're <laughs> not really <laughs> uh, I'm gonna ask a question. you mentioned you mentioned the who and you know they had a terrible thing happen over here at one of their mm -hmm. concerts um, where the kids got out of control that either oversold the thing or that was delayed and everybody charged in and a lot of the promoters of concerts got very wary because they didn't know how to control that enthusiasm. Uh, have you wonder, ever been a little scared at some of those concerts when the fans are all lined up that something like that could happen? Yes, I think you... I was very carried away. You get very conscientious by security. It's very tight at uh, concerts nowadays. Yeah. And about seven years in Baltimore I played there and uh, it was really tight security and this young girl came forward just to take a photograph and uh, this huge guard picked her up and threw it like 20 feet in the air and that was it. I stopped the show. Overreacted. Right. Yeah. So uh, I said, right, security guards out or I'll, you know, tear down the building. And um, five minutes later, the security guards were out and we had 500 people on stage with us. Um, <laughs> and I got banned from playing in Baltimore so, and up till this year because I was getting carried away with my own importance. I, I created a scene which is far more dangerous, really, than that right. girl being thrown in the air. It's just that sometimes you can't help feeling that people who are given responsibilities like that, and sure, you do have to have discipline and responsibilities, but I wish they wouldn't enjoy it so much. Yeah. Mm. It's, uh... <laughs> you, uh, you toured for almost, uh, without letter for what, about six years steady? Why do you think I'm so short now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Went yeah, down from no, six, three so, to five. Yes, um, you, yes we, I, it was like a... It was when I first happened, I came to the Troubadour Club in Los Angeles, and it was an absolute fluke. Uh, in 1970, I came over. I wasn't that keen. I just came over on the off chance. And I had an album out, and people expected me to come out and play very classical-type music, which was on the Elton John album at the time. And in fact, I came out with a three-piece band, and we played rock and roll. And I got one review from Robert Hilburn in the Los Angeles Times, which broke me right across the country, which is just yeah. um, phenomenal. You do have some classical background. Some, yes. Um, I used to go to the Royal Academy of Music on Saturdays after going to school from Monday to Fridays, which really was a real... actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because it, uh, I don't know, you know, I wanted to play soccer on Saturdays. But I, I stumbled, I was the sort of kid that didn't do much work but could just about make the grades. Yeah. And so I did that. Um, and in fact, looking back on it now, I wish I'd have started a little harder because uh, at the time my heart was set on rock and roll and things like that. And I learned to play 
music by sight, and in fact, I don't practice anymore, so I, I can't really play music. I can play chord sheets, it's but working not. pretty good for you. Yeah, it's not. I, I, the good thing about getting a formal education as far as classical music goes is that it teaches you chord structures and it gives you a, um, an everlasting love of melody. Better depth uh, yeah. in performing. You, um, I, I had a question on the tip of my mind and it, it evaded me for a moment. Uh, you, you've made a lot of money in your career. Uh, have you enjoyed it? I know oh, you invested in a, you, in a soccer uh, Yeah, uh, I don't really have many investments, but I have a, I have a soccer team in England um, called Watford. Uh, very humble. Are you bored by this on this guy's soccer it. team? Uh, I love mean, it. I, I was associated with them for like, uh, since 1973, and I used to go and watch them as a boy. They yeah. were my local team. I used to stand now on the terrace. And now I'm chairman and we're in the second division, we were in the fourth. So. Well, that's gotta it's, be like a it's like a fairy tale, pardon the expression. <laughs> <laughs>